as you bear them all along. Thus a road you travel, harbor dangers yet unknown. Are you growing weary in the struggle of it all? Oh, Jesus, where been always one of the great keynotes of accomplishment in the spiritual realm and through the years it has been the men of prayer that have been outstanding in accomplishment for the cause of righteousness and for the cause of God and the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ and of course this prayer has been the kind of prayer that is strong and desperate intercessory prayer the kind of talking with the Lord that holds fast, perseveres, and continues to knock. In fact, we are taught by Jesus that seek and ye shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you, ask and it shall be given. This is one of the great truths of the New Testament and the theme and the thread of this truth is woven into the fabric of the revelation of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. This matter of desperation in prayer always brings God on the, on the scene. Whether it be Moses crying to God to spare the people or blot me out of thy book or John Knox breathing out, give me Scotland or I die. The element of desperation must be present. Long, long time ago, one of God's great prophets, Elijah, knew the secret that could unlock the heavens. He possessed the sacred formula by which God's power was unleashed in flaming fire. Evil days need good men. And Elijah, a good man, strode onto the scene of wickedness and idolatry, which prevailed under the reign of a weak king and a wicked queen. He strode on that scene with a dauntless courage, 
which comes from obedience to divine command. Elijah challenged Ahab and Jezebel and all their idol-worshipping followers to meet on Mount Carmel. Here it was to be decided that the God that answered by fire, let him be God. Under the scorching sun, high up the slopes of Mount Carmel, with the shimmering sun-bleached plain below, the prophets of Baal raised their wild, agonizing cries to a God that was death. As the day wore on, their pleas became more excited, their voices became hoarse, their acts became more frenzied until finally the prophets covered with blood and panting with exhaustion, it was clear to all that Baal could not hear. But Elijah's prayer was different. His God was different. But after a simple earnest prayer, 63 words long, fire flashed from the skies, crackled on the altar, licked up the water, consumed the sacrifice, and demonstrated to a startled congregation that the Lord, he is God. What divine power did that lone prophet possess? You see, Elijah's prayer had its foundations deep in some basic spiritual principles which the Lord always honors. His prayer was a cry of desperation. All true prayer possesses that element. That is the heart attitude that moves the heart of God. How tragic that this is the element which so often is lacking in prayers today. Desperation cries always bring God on the scene. Peter's cry was desperate, Lord, save me. The publican's prayer was desperate. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Whether it be Moses crying to God to spare the people, or else, blot me out of thy book, or John Knox breathing out, give me Scotland or I die, that same element of desperation must be present. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. You see, our need is desperate, for this is a desperate time. Substitutes will not meet our need any more than they could kindle fires upon Elijah's altar. But the nation was saved because one man was desperate enough to cry unto the Lord Most High. And today the church can feel the rapture of heaven's flames if Christians can be moved to desperate intercession. Elijah's prayer was prompted by a sense of God-given responsibility. His challenge to the prophets of Baal was not cheap showmanship. His daring is explained by these words, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, this is the thing that gives a man courage to face wicked kings and treacherous priests. This is the thing that dulls the glamour of this vain world's golden star and gives a man fortitude to stand as God's servant, whatever the personal cost may be. What a responsibility is ours. Ours is the task of keeping spiritual values alive in an age of materialism. Ours is the task of keeping a vital sense of God upon the church. Ours is the task of redeeming men from the power and practice of sin until they can become bearers of gospel light wherever they go. Should not a responsibility such as this drive us to our knees with a soul-consuming burden? Elijah's prayer was a result of a passion to make God known. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God. His soul was tortured by their ignorance of God, their transgressions of his holy laws. His object was not that his name might be exalted as a prophet, or that good might come to him, but that blinded eyes might be opened, that their hearts might be brought to a knowledge of God. A passion such as this gives a daring that borders on audacity. What difference if Elijah was outnumbered by the prophets of Baal? This nation must know that God is the Lord. Such burning zeal to make the Lord known to others will give the people of God boldness at the throne of grace. Such a pure, unselfish passion to see the light of knowledge of Christ break through to men will rid us of our caution, our indolence, our inferiorities, and our cowardice. Desperate praying like that of Elijah will bring this to pass. 
praying that is prompted by a sense of God-given responsibility to Christ and lost souls will accomplish it. Petitions wrung from the hearts of Christians whose soul-consuming passion is to make Christ known will bring an answer from Elijah's God. And mark it well, importunity is an element in prevailing prayer. There are some things we cannot receive from God unless we pray with insistency and importunity. And I urge you in the name of the Lord to bruise your knuckles on God's door. Let me bring to you a scriptural passage. In the book of Mark 9th chapter, the story is told of a situation where a man brought unto the Lord a son which had a dumb spirit. Wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him. He foameth and gnashes with his teeth and pineth away. And I speak to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And in this very remarkable story, the Lord steps into the breach. And then, as he does, he casts out the spirit of Satan. And it declares to the disciples the wonderful power that was manifest in the person of Christ. When he was come into the house, this is Mark 9, 28 and 29. His disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind come, can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And there it is, friend, interwoven into the thread of the truth that is constantly demonstrated in the verbiage of the Bible. That there's power in prayer. But where in all the world are we going to get prayer that will do all that? The kind that Daniel offered, which shook the Babylonian Empire from one end to another, bringing Almighty God into his rightful preeminence. The kind that Nehemiah offered, which set rulers running after him with men, money, and materials to help rebuild the walls of ruined Jerusalem. It was the Lord who in himself who inspired the prayer of Nehemiah. The prayer that made Jerusalem a new city. He drove his servant to his knees by the burden of a great concern for ruined Jerusalem. This is the way God works. And will, give, and will God give this kind of prayer today? And I answer yes. Through the Holy Spirit. The Lord can give us the hurricane kind of prayers that make things move when nothing else can make them move. And I'd like to add here, the Lord save us from turning these wheels by our own efforts. You see, it cannot be done. Let us ask the Lord for the kind of praying. Prayer straight from God to strengthen all who are weak. To straighten out every tangle to meet every need. When we offer his prayer as put into our spirits, there will be no such thing as unanswered prayer. Every prayer will be as mighty as God because his nature will be in them. The difficulties we face at the present time will vanish. We shall not speak as if God were bankrupt. The Lord will then be seen in our lives. His power will flow through us in flood tides of blessings to others. Miracles will happen in every sphere that we touch. Every need will be met. The devil will be defeated. May this heaven-born flame be lighted afresh in the hearts of the newborn throughout our world today. And may there come a sensibility of this great need in our very, very tragic and needy hour. When men have lost the sense of a relationship with the Lord and do not understand the importance of the vital power of prayer. If you're listening to me over this radio broadcast today, I would like to urge you to the recognition that God does hear and answer prayer. And that persevering, interceding, crying out to God still accomplishes a purpose that is beyond the uh, imagination of man. So wherever you are today, somehow grasp the real fact about it. And pray till your eyes go dim. Go with your troubles straight to him. Pray, pray, for God understands. Have faith leaving all in his dear hands. And he will, and he can, and he does. Answer prayer.